Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Going Pro Podcast. Here where we interview professional musicians or people who have decided to make their life all about music and who have just become passionate about music and it's all they really can do. On today's show, I got Daniel Williams. How you doing, Daniel? I'm doing pretty good, Jordan. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Daniel, he won't say it, so I will. One of the best guitarists in the world. If you live where I live, Daniel's the go-to guy. If you want a jazz player, a rock player, anything you can imagine, Daniel will play it the day you ask him to. It's really unbelievable. Um, I mean, it, it really is crazy. Actually, that intro song that we were just listening to is from about four years ago. Me and Daniel played on an album together. It was just something we wrote in college, messing around. And that was him playing guitar, and I was playing drums for that, believe it or not. And his guitar back then was just out of this world, and it's only gotten better. Listen to that track. How do you achieve those kind of sounds that you were playing? Uh, so with that, I was probably, I think I was using an Orange Amp, probably the 8030. Um, that's one of my go-to like kind of rock amps that I have. Um, and like effects-wise, I was probably using like a really like hardcore saturated distortion kind of thing, like the uh, Proco Turbo Rat. Uh, I think I would have been using back then, uh, and then the Digitech Whammy. Uh, that's always been pretty much a staple on my pedal board. Nice. Um, so yeah, set that to two octaves up, and then just cool. get crazy with it. Yeah, because even listening to it, those pitches are much higher than a guitar can achieve. So that oh yeah, it's just yeah. crazy how playing guitar is one thing, but then the pedals and effects you choose really affect your style and the sounds that you can get. Yeah, uh, I I really try to look at it as uh, their kind of instruments in their own right and i need to like take time to you know kind of work with them uh to figure out their little nuances and stuff and then see how that will incorporate into my playing and so as someone i play guitar a little bit just like acoustic i know the chords and stuff that's always intimidated me seeing these guitar players with these massive pedal boards where the heck do you even start with stuff like that oh man well I mean, I started off with just like a multi-effects pedal. I think it was like a Zoom, just something. I don't even remember what the model name would be. Mm. It's pretty old school. Um, what do you mean by multi-effects? Uh, so it's just like a single pedal that has multiple functions. Uh, okay, so it can you. do like distortion and reverb and all that oh, kind of stuff. Uh, the one that I used, it had just like different presets that you went between and it would have like multiple different things like a distortion with the phaser uh or like a distortion and the expression pedal is a wah or a volume oh, I pedal see, cool. um but yeah that's where i started off uh but i mean another good place to look is to just like kind of look at the artists that you oh, like yeah. and uh like see what they're using um you know how you might be able to incorporate that into your sound uh so for instance when i was getting started building a board i was really into pink floyd so i was looking around at all the different uh david gilmore kind of pedals that i could get uh, i'd got like the cattle and bread echo rec which is a really nice benson echo rec tape delay uh oh, cool. recreation uh and yeah that's been a staple on my board uh, mm-hmm. ever since i just love that thing if you could go back in time or just for any young guitar players, what are three essentials for every board? Uh, a tuner, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and those things are sweet. Anytime I play with guitar players, they can just cut their volume down and tune their guitars instantly. Oh yeah, they usually do it between every single song. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so yeah, a tuner, tuner, tuner definitely. Uh, probably a volume pedal so yep, that they yep. don't feel like they have to be at full blast all. The- at all times um and man i don't know i don't think there are any essentials necessarily it just kind of depends on the music that you're playing yeah uh like if you're you know if you're playing just like kind of like I don't know, Latin jazz kind of stuff you don't need like these crazy modulated delays like Mm. the echo rec or something like that um, so you just got to look at like what you're playing, what your needs are specifically yeah. for the different kind of music that you're going to be making. Oh, sweet, man. Cool. And something about Daniel, he's a very special and unique individual. He has what's called perfect pitch. And so just as a um, prerequisite, perfect pitch means like absolute understanding of audio frequencies and notes. And it's kind of an innate thing. Um, about one out of 10,000, from what I saw, like one out of 10,000 people have it. 
And it most of the time you're born with it, but it can be developed at a young age, like in Asian countries. They're like Mandarin is a pitched language, so a lot of the kids will pick it up when they're in rigorous music training at a young age, plus speaking a pitch language, they get an understanding quickly. But for people like my piano tu- teacher, uh, piano tuner, Glenn, he has it and he tunes pianos completely in his mind. And he described it to me as something that even growing up, he would hear a lawnmower and know what the pitch of it was. And it's just a sense that he can perceive like the way we hear things or see things. So for you, Daniel, do you relate to that? How is yours kind of manifested? Uh, yeah, I definitely relate to that a uh, good bit. Uh I mean, it's just, it's not something I ever really, like, noticed I could do until it was pointed out to me by my dad. Yeah, you Um, told me that story. Go ahead and tell us. uh, So I was just, like, at Guitar Center uh, buying a bass for my birthday one year, and I asked the employee that was helping us out, uh, hey, can I get a tuner? And he was like, oh, it, it should be all in tune. And I was like, well, it's in tune, but it's an E flat standard. It's a half step and down. kids don't know that. That's... Like I wanted, I wanted to play it in regular E standard tuning. Mm. And my dad was like, what? He's, he's a musician himself. So he would have, he was able to recognize that pretty quickly. Yeah, that's crazy. And it is something that you perceive as a sense. You've never had to work on it or try and do that. Yeah, no, it's just like, I don't know. I've got just like a catalog of. Mm-hmm. different sounds and stuff in my head that I can pull from at any moment. And I guess your musical training too has helped giving you language to those feelings as well. Yeah, definitely. And then another thing, I have what's called relative pitch where I've gone through training. I can hear intervals. So if I hear a starting pitch, I can kind of tell you what the chord progression is or what notes based around that. But I have no, if I just hear a pitch out of the blue with no reference point, I have no idea what it is. Um, so check this out. If I was to just play a note, check out what Daniel can do. This is so fun. What note we got? G, natural. No. All right. A. A, nice, brilliant. D. All right, if we're going to play a chord now, what do we got? B flat. Excellent. Major. And then this one? A major. All right, I'm going to do an inversion now. This is a first inversion G major. Yeah, brilliant. All right, one more tough one. Um, I'm going to give the D minor nine. Yeah. Unbelievable. Super cool. So that's just an example of how it works. Would you say in your career, has that helped you or hindered you? Do you think? Uh, I mean, I definitely think it's pretty helpful. I can just kind of sit in different situations. And as long as I can clearly hear like what's going on with the other musicians i can pretty much just like kind of pick up what's going on uh so it's been really helpful in situations where i haven't been able to like you know just have my phone and look up a chord sheet Mm -hmm. or whatever um i can just kind of you know feel it out listen the one flaw that i've heard about people with perfect pitch as musicians you probably haven't experienced this is that they don't learn the problem solving methods because they can always rely on their perfect pitch so then when it comes to transposing or transcribing something, you're not able to act as quickly because you've relied on hearing the notes, not act necessarily working through the motions of doing it. Have you seen that at all? Uh, yeah, I've definitely seen that. Like, especially I'm sure you remember in theory class with yeah. uh, Dr. Kim, he would have to or change he would, the key. Yeah, he would yeah. make us write. He would write. We would notate the music in a different key from what he was playing. Yeah, that's of, right me so yeah uh, sorry about that yeah guys. because if you were in the class and he was doing it in the right key you wouldn't have to work through the process of the intervals or whatever you could just write out what you're hearing yeah so yeah i could thank goodness dr kim did that to you then <laughs> but yeah super cool how's it um and you it's not just music you can hear like everyday stuff right like your refrigerator or an engine you know yeah what those like if are. a blender is going like it can hear what frequency it's at Gosh, that's uh, so cool. Yeah, because everything's out of frequency. Breaks squealing on the interstate. Yeah, super cool. Man, and that probably leads you to get, getting some inspiration for Folly. If you hear something, be like, oh, I could sample that in this key. Honestly, yeah, dude. <laughs> semi, semi-trucks semi just like going down the highway, uh-huh. hearing that from a distance, it just sounds like a movie soundtrack or yeah, something. Yeah. Just this crazy like... And then you could put some cellos underneath that and yeah. as an ambient feel. Yeah, that's super cool. It's something yeah, like that. how about that? Sweet. So as far as you learn music very quickly, you learn a lot of music throughout your life. Have you mostly used like tabs or because the guitar players use tabs? You're really the only one of the only instruments that can do that because of your frets. 
or do you read sheet music or do you listen to it by ear? What's your learning process? Uh, I do all of it. It just kind of depends like how quickly do I need to learn it? Mm -hmm. uh, what is available to me to help me learn it? True. Um, I use this website called Scribd. Uh, it's just like an app I've got on my phone and I can just go through and like search and find sheet music for like mm -hmm. tons of different things. So like if I really want to like get into and innately understand what's going on with the music like yeah i'll read the sheet music for it if i just need to quickly learn like a specific little guitar lick or solo or something like i'll probably just look up the I tabs uh, because like especially going back to having perfect pitch i feel like i can uh, kind of listen to what's going on mm -hmm. on the tabs in my head like i can oh, yeah. i can kind of understand it a bit better than just like reading it and placing my fingers where it mm. says to place them. So with tabs, do you think that's good or bad for young musicians to use tabs? Um, it is a, I, I would say it's definitely a helpful tool, but you also got to list like, yeah, cause I know it's controversial because notation. some people can get overly reliant on it and then they can play all these guitar songs, but they really know nothing about how the guitar works. They just have kind of formulated what they're Yeah. It's do. just muscle memory. You yeah. don't really have the innate knowledge of the music that's happening. But there. like you said, it's a good tool to use every once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say so. Nice. But you've, mo so when you started out, you mostly use tabs instead of sight reading kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I would use tabs or, uh, just my ear. I didn't know nice. how to read music gotcha. until we got to college. And now you're quite good at it, right? Yeah, I'd say so. So as a piano player, I have 10 fingers, and when I'm reading music, they all kind of line up. My fingers don't get in the way of each other. When you're playing guitar, it just blows my mind when you sight read. You have one hand. Don't your fingers ever kind of get mixed up, or do you understand what positions you need to be in and stuff? Oh, well, especially for sight reading. That's what that, I'm thinking. That yeah. does happen. Like, oh, my gosh. If I uh, need to get to this G, but I can't reach my finger over, et cetera. Yeah, because, well, one area where tabs are a bit superior to, uh, like, written music, I would say, is that you know where you're supposed to put your fingers yeah. if you're just reading if they're just giving you the notes, well, mm -hmm. you know, you've got like so many different positions you can so play. Like mid, how many note. middle C's are on your guitar? How many middle C's? Or just of any of the same note? Because they're the same pitched note. They just sound a little bit different, right? Whereas on the piano, I have one middle C. If I see middle C is notated, I know exactly where that's supposed to be. So that's yeah, what, exactly. So it's a little bit confusing. Like I definitely feel like it's easier for me to learn how to play like piano stuff from sheet yeah. music rather than guitar. Um, but like, let me look here. Yeah, it's just like, how the heck do you know what position that you're going to play in? So I think with sight reading guitar music, you really have to think ahead a little bit more than you would. Piano's a lot more straightforward. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And if you're doing something like uh, some solo uh, kind of classical guitar stuff, mm -hmm. they do help a little bit with that. Oh, um, yeah. There's like a numbering system that oh, okay, they cool. use for the fingers. Yeah, I have seen that. Where in place of the note, it'll have a number there. Uh, not in place of the note, or, just like kind of above the note telling oh, you what okay, fingers you. you're supposed to use. Nice, sweet. So just as far as playing guitar, when you were young and even now, what's some of your biggest influence? Like what really made you want to sit down and practice guitar? What made you just not stop thinking about what song was playing? Oh, man. Well, of course, David Gilmore that I mentioned uh, from Pink Floyd mm. uh, really kind of turned me back on to guitar after a little period of kind of walking away from it, kind of exploring other options. When was that? Um, uh, like middle school, high school. Oh, okay, I got you. Yeah, long time not, so not like a professional, not in a professional sense. I was walking away from the guitar. I was just like kind of bored with it as a kid. But like then, yeah, I got you. Uh, started listening to Pink Floyd, and that really opened me to a lot of, uh, you know, interesting chord progressions and stuff that mm -hmm. I hadn't heard yet. Because like being a progressive rock band, they're really influenced by. Uh, different like kind of classical and jazz influences and just like use different chords that you wouldn't necessarily yeah. hear in pop music like a very non-diatonic yeah like hearing a d minor major seven chord oh, yeah, in a cool. just a rock song that's weird uh it's us and them from dark side of the moon but mm, uh yeah. yeah david gilmore really got me uh going i'd say i'd Definitely still try to play very lyrically and melodically like he does. Uh, uh, you know, going to college and like 
uh, learning about all these different like kind of bebop guitarists and stuff uh, in my lessons and different jazz history classes, you know, you part of me definitely wants to play like really yeah. fast like that. Mm. But then like listening to David Gilmore and still having that influence, I still want to play very melodically and lyrically. Yeah. Um, more recently, some of my influences, I would say. Uh, this isn't necessarily guitar specific, but uh, Steely Dan has been oh, a yeah. very Just influential for your music, band. I know they're great. Yeah, uh, like all the different like chord voicings that they use, progressions. And those guys are really advanced theoretically, theoretically, weren't they? Uh, as musicians. Yeah, they were pretty pretty advanced. Uh, because they were really, they were kind of the opposite of me, mm-hmm. where they were really into jazz. And um, then uh, the Beatles came around, and they got like the, the they got bitten by the rock bug. Yeah, those guys. There. It makes me think of like Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. They were all such phenomenally trained musicians, and then they produced this outstanding quality of music. And Steely Dan's kind of like that, where it's just at like virtuosic level of performance, mm-hmm. and that is just really rare these days, unless you really look for it. Yeah, and I mean part of the thing that contributes to that is just their like absolutely revolving cast of different studio musicians so they would have and they would all come in and like you know yeah this is a steely dan song but you've got so many different influences that go into each specific song depending on the different musicians that are playing on it so i feel like listening to them has just like broadened my horizons so much yeah, their um, Asia album is spectacular. So good. Yeah, if you guys are looking for something great, to just listen to the Asia album. I mean, every song is spectacular. Oh, yeah. It. And it's just, it's one of the best technically produced yeah. albums as well. And like, what year did that come out? Was that in the 80s? Uh, I want to say 1977. Man, yeah. unbelievable. What um, what other influences you got? More, more, more modern day. More modern day? Um... Because I know you play a piano a lot recently, and even drums, too. Do you have any influences for that stuff? Yeah. Uh, I really like this band, uh, this Australian band, King Gizzard and the Lizard mm. Wizard. I'm, I'm sure I've I told you it. about them before. Oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Rattle they Snake. Rattle oh, Snake. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, they're that, great. <laughs> that album is really cool. Their explorations into microtonal tunings yeah. and instrumentation. Uh, but also, I just really like the way they you know play around with time signatures and stuff. Yeah, they really produce, cool. like... It's it's all really groovy, but it is still like just weird yeah. enough to make you like be like oh okay. yeah, and it's not distinctive. I've listened to them, and they're they'll be in like seven eight or or eleven eight or something weird, but you don't necessarily notice that because it's so subtle. Yeah, yeah. In there, it's really driven by the percussion, and even their um their singers fantastic. Mm-hmm. Stu, good old yeah, Stu. Yeah, really cool. Um, but stuff like that, it kind of takes an accustomed ear. Not everyone's gonna like that. Will them? No, no, yeah, it's definitely... You have to go into it with a sense of this is spectacular musicianship, but it's not general consumption. Yeah, I don't want to say it's, like, niche and, like, oh, not everyone's going to get this. It's only for specific people, but, like, it's definitely not for everyone, and I probably wouldn't have appreciated it as much uh, before I went to school. But when you understand what's happening, whoa. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Super creative. Definitely. Nice. So, um, let's see. Rec- so Daniel, something about Daniel, like you kind of heard, he has a really diverse um, type of songs that he listens to. So if you were going to recommend someone that wants to kind of diversify what they're listening to, what would be a place to go? Like album? Oh, man. Well, so someone who's just kind of their whole life listened to just kind of contemporary, whatever's on the radio. I know A Direction is kind of like Snarky Puppy, Chick Korea. That's kind of where people start going if they want to listen to something unique. What's something you got? Yeah, well, Snarky Puppy definitely yeah. helped me uh, kind of open my ears to the 100%. jazz stuff a little bit more. Uh, like my freshman year of college, I wasn't even sure if I still wanted to go for like yeah. jazz. I thought I might want to go for like a production side of things. But then I listened to Snarky Puppy and it was like, oh, okay, I think I'm understanding this jazz thing a little bit more now. And, you know, it allowed me to go explore some of the more traditional kind of stuff, you know, Miles Davis, Chick Corea, uh, and really grasp more of an understanding and appreciation for that. Yeah. Speaking of Miles Davis, as a guitar player, you have to make solos and Miles Davis trumpet player. That's kind of just soloing a lot. How, what's kind of your mindset when creating a solo on your guitar? Hmm. Well, it depends on 
you know, kind of the song that I'm playing. Yeah. Uh, you know, different. I try to think, you know, dynamics aren't always just about like volume. Yeah. Uh, I, I read this book by Victor Wooten and he talked about yeah. that, uh, that, you know, you can change the dynamics within tempo and, and like, uh, like subdividing the notes that you're playing, yeah. like playing a very long note is going to be dynamically different from playing lots of short notes. Mm. Um, so it just depends on, you know, the song I'm playing, where am I at in the song? Yeah. Uh, if it's like a, you know, kind of a longer, slower ballad kind of thing, like I'll definitely, you know, my mindset will go to like, uh, longer notes, mm, yeah. uh, trying to think more of the overall melody that I'm trying to create yeah. rather than just like playing like chord tones yeah the pitfall everything. i fell into and i'm sure you can relate to this when i first started doing like jazz and solos on piano i would just be trying to like blast out scales and go as fast as i could just because you think a solo is kind of the time to show off but then i realized that if i'm playing a solo i can make it very melodic and not just the notes i play but the way i play those notes like that but like mm -hmm. accenting certain notes in there can make you could play just two notes and make it sound really cool by accenting and then finding like cells so if i'm soloing but da da dum and then going on a different note, da 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 bum, and just mm. playing that a couple times, and then maybe changing it, but finding ideas to kind of create during your solos. Have you started doing that as well? Yeah, definitely. Like if you're soloing and you hear something that you really like within that solo, yeah. and you know, m music is about like sharing your feelings with other people. So mm. if you feel yeah. like, uh, like ooh, this sounds really cool, chances are other yeah. people are going to think it sounds cool too. So like, you know, lay into that, mm -hmm. uh, whatever it is. Like if you've got this cool little lick that you've created right then. Yeah. Dude. And then something else I've been learning about the half steps, dude, half steps just carry so much emotion into them. Oh yeah, for sure. In your solos and stuff. That's kind of where all the meat is. Cause then you're not just rolling on your pentatonic. You're throwing those half steps in there and being intentional with what mm -hmm. kind of sound you're creating. And I mean, you're uh, every, I think it might've been Victor Wooten who said it, but you're only ever, half step away from the right note yeah that's right i actually met him one time with greg ale wine me oh to a yeah, yeah, yeah gosh it was spectacular and if you guys don't know victor wooten he was like four years old and he was the youngest i think all his other siblings already played instruments in a band and so he was just kind of forced to play bass but i mean he is and as far as showmanship too he'll throw his bass up in the air while he's playing and mm. catch it he, um, just really spectacular. It's almost like the things that he thinks in his head and the, the sounds he can make with his mouth, he can perfectly replicate with his bass, mm -hmm. which is kind of the ultimate level of mastery. Yeah, that's that's another uh, important point of improvisation that I try to work on yeah. is like if you can sing what you want to be playing, like if you hear something in your head that you're mm -hmm. like, oh, this is what this solo needs to sound like. And if you can sing it and like if you can play what you're singing yeah. and that I feel like that makes it a lot easier to play very melodically. Yeah. And lyrically. I'm not a singer. I know that you can sing, but you don't necessarily identify yourself as a singer either. But I found that really impactful for myself starting to sing along while I'm playing, just trying to match pitch with the mm -hmm. notes too. And even though I'm not necessarily singing, just matching the notes with your voice. That's what I've started to do. Yeah. And even like, because when you're singing, you have to take breaths. Yeah. You're not just oh, going to yes. be playing all the time. You know, yeah, that dude. space that you leave between there is Gosh, really where... that is so key. And I, people like us, if you're playing piano or guitar, you never think about that. Yeah, but that's where, you yeah. know, you see like a trumpet player or a sax player, like they got to take breaths. So it's not always just... Mm -hmm. really, really, really. And it creates well, I mean, your I guess phrasing. You're sincere, you have an idea and then it has a starting point and a landing point. Yeah. And then a starting point. Yeah, that's really key. Um, And you're throughout playing guitar what do you think has been the biggest impact like things that you've done that have really let you get to the next level or a realization that you made oh wow um, so that could be like discovering a certain scale or even playing with other musicians like what has been the biggest impact to your skill honestly i think just playing with other musicians yeah. like uh like whether it was people that I was playing with at AU, like people older than me, the Coleman's, yeah, uh, yeah. uh, or just like, you know, messing around with like Trent and Michael and yep. people like that. Uh, yeah. Just playing with other people forces you to 
dive into the social aspect of music Mm -hmm. and playing synchronized with other people is just going to build your timing and your feel and I feel like it just made me so much more confident in this, yeah. as a musician. And something I people. really regret is most of my life I've only played drums with bands. I haven't really played piano as much with bands just because there's a larger need for drummers. But I've started playing with jazz groups recently, and I've noticed my progress has gone spectacular, like through the roof since I started doing that. Mm-hmm. And I think one thing that holds me back is I just fear that I'm not ready to do something like that. But you're really never going to be ready if you have that mindset. I wish I could go back a few years ago and put myself in uncomfortable positions because I realized I would have learned much more. Do you ever feel like that playing guitar, like you're going into an environment where you don't don't necessarily feel practiced for or prepared for? Oh, for sure, all the time, because uh, I never practice. Uh, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it um, usually turns out way better than you expected, right? Yeah, sometimes. But, I mean, also just like that kind of like messing up mm-hmm. and like leaving a gig and feeling like, Oh man, that yeah. I could have done way better in there. Really, like that's good for you. 100%. I feel like because that'll like force you to work and do better. Yeah. Do you have any really embarrassing stories of a gig? Uh, nothing that comes to mind. No. I don't. I, I am I feel so like, like there's something there. <sighs> you had to have broken a string or knocked something over. I mean, I've spilled some drinks on stage and stuff oh, before. Nice. That never feels good. I always feel like a dunce when I do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, because you're usually so well prepared, or even if you're not, you can improvise. You've never really made any big mistakes, have you? Yeah. I mean, nothing that's like, I've never felt like I've been super put out on the spot. Like, oh my gosh, this guy sucks. Yeah, yeah. Like, look <laughs> at this guy making such a fool of himself. I've never felt yeah. like that before. And people don't really do that. I think we kind of think that in our mind that someone's going to do that, but really, nobody really cares that oh, much. Oh yeah, it's, it's all in your head. Yeah, and in the music community especially, I think people are way more supportive than we realize. Mm-hmm. Like, if you saw a guitar player who was less experienced than you, you would probably feel more inclined to help them than to judge them. Definitely, yeah. yeah. And I've noticed that as I've gotten older. Whenever I was younger, I thought everybody was worried about what I was doing. Or thinking about what I was doing, but they're really not. Um, what band that you've played with do you think you've learned the most from? Because I know you played with Chris for a while, you played with Walker for a while, Gilbert Neurosis. What? Uh, probably playing with uh, the band formerly known as Green Eggs and Yams, uh, now known as Sincere Experience. Oh, yeah, that was you guys do some crazy stuff. Yeah, we did some crazy stuff with that. I'll have uh, to put some links like to some, that in case anyone wants to check them out because they are crazy. Just like some like improvisational weird stuff Mm -hmm. uh but again playing with like a revolving cast of musicians like that really helped me too because i was able to like uh you know kind of figure out how to adapt my playing to different uh environments and situations yeah that's so true because you fit in differently with different musicians yeah definitely you play with trent and sincere in that and otis yeah so it was like uh trent was one of the guys like pretty much always sincere uh, Otis, Tim. Oh gosh, uh, what an all star cast! Yeah, uh, I they, guess Max was. Uh, Max, yeah, Max yeah. would play with us. Um, yeah, and so playing uh, with all those people that are so experienced, finding where you can fit in or finding space for yourself in that environment without being too much, but kind of if Trent's playing guitar, you don't want to cover up what he's doing, just finding cracks to fit into. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, man, that's uh, cool. It definitely helps you figure out uh, <clears throat> like how to adapt yourself to not just playing the same way every yeah, time yeah. like you're not always just going to be playing like the same like kind of low chords like mm-hmm. you can l- figure out where you can play some higher chords or yeah, like some cool. even just like little like passing lines and stuff little mm-hmm. octave kind of things <clears throat> so yeah community has definitely been very important to your development for sure yeah how about school how did school affect you being in music university uh well i feel like my community was directly uh produced from being yep. at music school Mm -hmm. um what about the professors some of them i like really connected with and then like some of them it was just like yeah like i'm learning from you but i'm not really like connecting with you and then i know this is kind of controversial but i think in school we just get a lot of irrelevant information Uh, yeah (laughs) i hate to say it and a lot of it's so good. Like there were some classes I would sit in and just get so much information. But then other times I was like, what am I doing here? Yeah, there were definitely 
some classes where I was like, okay, is this completely necessary yeah. to me as a commercial music guitar? And that's tough. It almost gets to the point where it's like, do you even need school or could you just do it on your own? Yeah, this is that's the big <laughs> question, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, and I mean, especially with YouTube now, you can learn anything you want. You can learn or, a lot. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, it just comes down to the accreditation. I don't know. It's something I've been pondering a lot in my own life. Like, would I have been better off just working on my own and saving that money? But then you did get to meet a lot of really special individuals, which you wouldn't have had otherwise. So there's pros and cons for sure. Yeah. Uh, between, like, peers and, like, the different professors that you're able to build relationships with, like, Greg and... Yeah. Uh, yeah, Greg. Uh, <laughs> well, you like your guitar teachers. Oh, yeah, Bruce is, yeah, Bruce yeah. is great. Yeah, Greg's Just the best. A plus, man. <laughs> the best. What, um, what do you think is the future of music? So I know, especially with coronavirus shutting a lot of stuff down, it's been hard to play around. But that's opened up to a lot of more online content or live streaming. What do you think the future looks like? Um, I mean, it, I, I haven't really played around with the live stream thing yeah. uh, much. I've never really been kind of a... I've never really been much of a social media person uh, yeah, yeah. in general anyways. Uh, but I mean, if that works for people and that's like a lucrative uh, like venture for them to do mm -hmm. as a musician, then like, yeah, go ahead and do that. Yeah. I but think that I've, area has blown up since coronavirus because people need something to do. So guys like, um, what's his name? Samurai guitarist. I don't know if you've ever seen him. Oh stuff. yeah. He's yeah. Blown up on YouTube since a lot of stuff like that. But wait, what were you saying? Uh, but I, I also feel like live music, at least here in South Carolina, hasn't gone away yeah. like all that much. Like mm -hmm. I still play out semi regularly. Yeah. Definitely not as much as before. So but. what I mean, I'm really hoping for this. Once everything starts to get kind of back to normal, people will be craving this. Like I played at a bar a couple weekends ago and there was like eighty people there. And so as we continue to overcome this, people will be like, man, this last year I haven't done anything. I'm dying to go to some concerts. I'm dying to experience things. Oh, yeah. So who knows? It could lead to an influx. Yeah. I mean, I played in Clemson a couple weeks ago, yeah. and I felt like that crowd was just awesome. Gosh. So what does that do to you? Like if you're playing in front of a small crowd, not that small crowds can't be good, or just like a crowd that's not interested versus a crowd that's very engaged. Uh, small crowd will make me – more aware of kind of what I'm doing. Ooh, yeah. uh, it'll, it'll make me think more uh, musically and not as much about my like overall performance. Yeah, your like, mm -hmm. If I'm just like playing for a small crowd and you know, they're kind of away from the stage uh, and not really uh, active getting into the music, mm -hmm. then I'm definitely going to be more like in my head, like thinking about what I'm doing uh, but then versus a large crowd, like if they're really into it, you know, they're like playing off of me, I'm playing off of them. Uh, that's going to be, it, it's very like enriching for me. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like a dopamine rush, isn't it? Oh, for sure. Like for sure. It's like mm -hmm. definitely, uh, like a dopamine hit hitting. Yeah. Like that's why just, you do it, isn't it? It feels great. Yeah. It's, it's the best feeling ever. And, uh, like playing with an engaged audience like mm -hmm. that will make me think about not just how I'm playing, but yeah. like how I can be like sort of a showman too yeah. and continue. Dude, Cause that to really like... is a big part of it, isn't it? Yeah. You could be the best guitarist in the world, but without being able to present yourself like that, no one will really want to come see you. Mm -hmm. You won't stay engaged. All right. Who is the best guitarist in your mind? All time. <laughs> All time. <laughs> <laughs> Took you off guard. Prince, isn't it? I mean, he's pretty Dude, dang good. Dude, people don't good. realize how good Prince was at guitar. Prin people don't realize how good Prince was at every instrument. Gosh. Like, ha I think like half of his albums he just recorded by himself. Yeah, he did all of it. He played the drums, everything. Mm -hmm. uh, Have you heard the thing about him having a secret vault in his house? Like just full of unreleased music? Yes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I so feel like his, a lot of musicians have that, his honestly. His sister was saying that he kept all the best music for himself and his family, and there's enough content to release an album every year for the next 70 years. Uh, and it's like under the prints. So it, uh, one day it could go into general domain, but they're keeping it kind of locked up for right now. Mm -hmm. I think there was like 12 music videos that are totally unreleased. Wow. It's like a thousand songs maybe. Like unbelievable. But yeah, yeah, back to best guitar player. Best guitar player... All you know, a lot of people time. go to like Jimi Hendrix or Eric Clapton. What do you think? Uh, 
I don't know, man. Jack I don't... Black. <laughs> he's, he's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, people don't realize how good he is either. I don't know. I don't feel like I'm qualified to make such a, a statement. Yeah, like and you that. can't say who's best. Or, there's different um, styles. My, who's your favorite? My favorite guitarist. Man, I don't even know what to I know, say. You to really that. can't answer it. Uh, let me just list some people that I really like. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, Alan Holdsworth is really cool. From, He's got freakish fingers. Alan Holdsworth is just a solo oh, okay, uh, cool. guitarist. Uh, or not solo, but he's like a uh, unaffiliated. He, he's just a musician. Yeah, cool. Uh, uh, yeah, Frank Zappa is oh, really. Yeah, gosh. I feel like he's pretty underrated for his guitar yep, playing, yep. like as opposed to like his entire compositions. Tom Quayle is really cool right now. Tosin Abasi, of course. Any people you know? Any personally? people I know personally yeah, that you've really uh, looked up to, uh, Trent Gilbert, yeah, uh, the Coleman's. But you and Trent kind of have a give and take, right? Like you guys learn off each other. Uh, I, I don't know if he learns yeah. anything from me. I I I definitely have learned a lot from wow, him. Wow, that's great. Uh, and yeah, the Coleman's—they're spectacular. Yeah, for sure. Ryan Lau is yeah, awesome. Yeah. Uh, let me think. And he's been really—he was on the Today Show. Yeah, I saw really that. Successful. That just makes you think anyone can do it, right? Yeah. Let me think <laughs> other genres. Um, I don't know what his name is, but whatever the guy, the guitar player's name is from Tower of Power, the oh, funk group. I've heard you talk about them, yeah. Yeah, he's awesome. I like how he can switch from like the funk rock to kind of more of like a jazzy, bluesy yeah. kind of feel. And that's kind of like your style. Uh, I yeah, I definitely try to get that in like uh, some situations. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, if you could tell any young guitar players or someone who's just kind of learning guitar anything to get them started off or any kind of inspiration, what would you tell somebody? Just keep practicing, <laughs> keep listening to music, learn your bar chords. <laughs> yeah, learn your learn your caged chords. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, learn all the meshy and modes. Uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, you got to give me that uh, Lydian dominant flat two. You got to learn that yeah. one. But no, uh, I would just encourage them to never lose the love for music because yeah, sure. that is what has kept me going Dude, that's like, scary, all these it? years. And something I fall, if I'm practicing a piece and I lose interest in it, I'm just going to stop doing it. I'm an adult now. I can learn what I want. Mm -hmm. If I lose interest, I'm going to always kind of be doing things that I find interesting. So I think that's a, you can get burnt out so easily. Yeah. And like, that's, what's kept me going is yeah. that I've always found stuff to keep me interested. Gosh, like look at other genres and stuff. Like yeah. you don't always have to be just, gosh, but that's probably why so many university music. musicians get like depression and just burn out. Cause you're just forced to do one thing. Yeah. You're just forced to do like the classical yeah. route or the yeah. jazz route. And I feel like that was where I kind of really and uh, then it's lucked graded. out. Yeah, it's great. But I feel like I kind of lucked out with doing the commercial music kind of thing. Yeah. Cause I was able to have those bands where well, I did 100%. like, you know, rock and pop stuff in addition yeah. to like just like straight head jazz I was learning in my lessons. Mm, cool. Uh, and then like playing percussion in the Wind Symphony was just a really great like kind of like it, it was oh, it, yeah. it didn't even feel like it was related to what I was doing. It was just kind of like an extra like side hobby. Yeah, that was a great experience for you, wasn't it? Oh, and then for sure. To witness Dr. Pettis. Oh, my gosh. Dr. Pettis. Yeah. Greatest. So the goat. He's a conductor, and I don't know if you guys realize how hard conducting is when you see the person up there doing their thing. Mm. I took, I thought it was easy myself, but I, you took conducting, right? I don't yeah, know you, yeah. With Dr. Pettis, I mean, it's your facial expressions, your body language, and you have to do all these things while keeping time, following the parts. And what's crazy about Dr. Pettis is he knows everything. Mm -hmm. So he'll be conducting from a whole score. If someone isn't doing something, he'd be like, ooh, you rushed at measure 72, the trombones or whoever. Yeah, he really has the ability to hear every single Gosh. And then individual aspect it. of the music. That is unbelievable. So at that point, you're basically a human mixing board. Mm -hmm. You are deciding what's going to be louder, what's going to be quieter with the speed, the feeling. Because that's the craziest thing. I didn't realize that the feelings you present are what the musicians will mirror. Yeah, it's like a like a whole meta instrument process yeah. almost. Like you've got all the different musicians playing their instrument, but mm -hmm. then you've got the conductor playing the orchestra as yeah. an instrument almost. I mean, 
And I think the layman or just the average Joe does not realize the work of a conductor. Mm -hmm. Whenever you and I, whenever I was a kid, you'd see the conductor up there, like, oh, what's he doing? He looks so silly. Just, mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> but you, I mean, he is really something. So getting to see Doctor Pettis firsthand, gosh, yeah, he's kind of mean sometimes, though, isn't he? In wind ensemble. Yeah, sometimes if you're like really yeah. like slacking, he'll call you out in front of, and he'll everyone. make you play your part in front of everybody, won't he? Yeah, he'll like isolate you. Did that ever like, happen to you? Yeah, yeah, really. It what, is what were you playing? Embarrassing. Uh, like different things. Uh, like he would do that if I was on like the snare drum, and like I was never really like a concert percussion uh, oh, before. Of course. And that's so hard to win symphony. Uh, I was, you know, I was good at like. Banging the cymbals together, yeah. I could get a good sound out of that. But like the specific like Dude, rolls and snare and is stuff. hard because there's hundreds of different sounds you can get out of that thing. Oh depending yeah, on how you like, hit it, and then there's accents and he would have me try to do like like the buzz saw rolls, just like yeah, and that's and so I, hard to get I in time. Could not do that. Yep, I would be sitting back there crying, just like <laughs> stop it, Pettis. Stop you got it. really good at counting rest though, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Is there a method like because I I've never played in a, a position like that, but I've Seeing the music where it'll say like 64 rests. What do you do? Do you, I guess you have cues or you remember something? Yeah, I just try to like divide it up into smaller parts. Oh, uh, yeah. So like uh, keeping time on my hands. Oh, uh, nice. Just, or not necessarily time, but just like. You cannot keeping, get distracted. Uh, keeping time or like keeping track of the measures that I'm at. So like yeah. one, two, three, four, two, two, yeah. three, four, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah. whatever. Uh, but like, yeah, if I've got a 64, uh, measure rest i'd try to break that down into like oh so i've got eight eight measure yeah, rests yeah. gosh that is so cool i wish i had done that i don't know why i think it was a time conflict with me something but sweet man it's been a pleasure having you on the show dude yeah thank you so much for having me yeah i mean just you guys i'll link some of daniel's bands in the description and whatnot you got to check him out he's fantastic but this has been another episode of the going pro podcast where we just talk to musicians and what the lifestyle is like how we learn how we operate and i hope you guys all have a wonderful day